All right, good evening, everyone. It is a Sunday night. You guys excited? And the crowd goes crazy. Those on the video, you can't catch it, but they're going crazy right now. Woo! It's a Sunday night. Yeah. yeah. It is the 17th of March. It's the day uh, we celebrate a um, uh, guy going back to Ireland after he was a captive of those people and went back to evangelize them. And I'm, I'm more for the original, the original uh, from what the story was about than what people make it out today. So it is St. Patrick's Day in the year of 24. And um, since it's a Sunday night, we're going to go on with the book of John. Now, you guys see, I did two more verses. I was going to go to six. But our scholar writes a page on each and every one of these. I didn't realize this narrative was so full of correlation and, and all sorts of things to look at. So it looks like we'll take our time going through the, the Gospel of John. And uh, the rate we're going will probably be the year 26. I thought it was going to be the year 25. So my little red truck's going to turn into an antique. I'm going to put the antique tag on it like I did my old diplomat. And uh, we're going to finish with the Gospel of John and go into Mark or Luke or Matthew or something. I don't know. But, yeah, my, yeah, my insurance dropped some more. I like $17 a year for tags. That's awesome. Yeah, I'm all about that. So, anyways, what's more important than any of that is Jesus. Amen? He's about to be arrested. And, of course, our scholar calls uh, all of chapter, most of chapter 18, um, the arrest and the hearing. And that's how he uh, uh, puts this. Tonight we're going to look at 3 and 4. And then uh, next week we're going to look at 5 and 6. And Mel mentioned 6 this morning. And you know what? We're going to look at 6 again. I can't believe that people go to arrest a person. He speaks, you hit the ground, and you still get, put, pick yourself back up to arrest him. <laughs> I'd be like, I'm done. I'd be like... <laughs> I'll be like, I'll be like those officers earlier. Um, no one talked like him. And then I'll be like, he, he spoke to us and we hit the ground. I was done. <laughs> Anyways, I always, to me, I've always found that baffling. We'll, we'll look at that a little bit in this study. But here we go. Let's read three and four. And we're just going to pray for a revival to happen in our nation. Uh, next week is Passion Week. It kicks off. So we're going to pray a a pretty weak Passion Week prayer that people will get a hold of the King of Kings and Lord of Lord that rode in. And then a week later, they crucified and he rose again by the time the week was up. I'm looking at the nice little posters we got in the back. So, yeah, next Sunday is Palm Sunday. And then, yeah, Palm, Palm Sunday. Yep, all the branches. All right, here we go. Then Judas, we know who he is, having received a detachment of troops and officers from the chief priests and Pharisees came there with lanterns, torches, and weapons. Jesus, therefore, knowing all things that would come upon him, went forth and said to them, Whom are you seeking? Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word, and we thank you, Lord, that we are coming up to this time of Passion Week. And Lord, your passion was to save every person who will hear the gospel and believe it. And that's what John's been teaching us. Lord, right now, we just ask, Lord, that you prepare the church for the people who are going to be coming in uh, in on these next two services that are coming up, Lord, and, and, and all the Good Friday services that will be happening and, and all the different ones that other churches do. And, Lord, we just ask that people will start asking about what it is to know you and have you in their heart. Lord, we ask for a revival to start from this Passion Week and sweep this country because it really, really needs it. Lord, we're in a, a political uh, election year, Lord, and it's just getting crazier by the second. But, Lord, we know that the, the first thing people need to get a hold of is you. So, Lord, we ask for this revival for our nation and then for the world. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 All right. Then Judas, we know who he is, having received a detachment of troops. Now, I'm going to bring something out with that. That's pretty interesting. The scholar brought it out. 
a detachment of troops is how the King James puts it, and officers from the chief priests and, and Pharisees came there with lanterns, torches, and weapons. Jesus, therefore, knowing that all things that would come upon him... Oh, sorry, then we're going to go... Yeah, we're, we're in three. So then Judas, having received a detachment of troops and officers uh, from the chief priests and Pharisees, came there with lanterns, torches, and weapons. So, the first action word is having received... Um, Mounts translates that, having procured, it's a participle, it's aorist, it's active. When the narrative is moving forward, it's usually in the aorist tense. So the narrative is just moving forward there. And then um, uh, a, a detachment of troops um, and officers from the chief priests and Pharisees came. Mounts translates that, went. And that's present but now it's in the middle voice so i hate to say it but judas really did it to himself that's what the middle voice means you do it to yourself um yeah so he brought yeah choice he brought it so this is really interesting the the scholar uh makes this note judas, judas had prior knowledge of where jesus where jesus and the rest of the disciples were all right that's my way of noting what he said now, this is interesting. If you go back to verse 2, it says Judas knew. And it was a verb that was in that pluperfect tense. And then when we get to uh, verse 5, it's going to say, They answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus said to them, I am he. And Judas, uh, who, who betrayed him, also stood or was standing, is how Mounts puts it, and it's in that pluperfect tense. So... I think what the scholar's doing and what the Greek grammar's doing here is the backstory of what Judas was doing is now back into the story that we're in. I just find the Greek grammar fascinating. You know. So the backstory, meanwhile, back at the temple when Judas was betraying him and got this and got all these people gathered, the backstory is now caught up to where we're at. Interesting, huh? Pretty cool. Anyways, the notes go on and just continue to get really fascinating. So here we go. So now he is here with a, this is how the, the, the New American Standard Bible translated. This is how, um, I think Mounts translated it this way too. Cohort. All right. The Greek word is sep septera. So I was like, all right, that's interesting. But um, a lot of uh, translations translate it cohort. So what is a cohort? All right. Well, let's go, to, let's go to Matthew first. So we'll just continue to look at biblical evidence before I give you the other evidence. Then the soldiers of the governors took Jesus to the praetorium and gathered the whole garrison. It's that same, it's that same Greek word. Yeah. Garrison around him. And, um, and uh, there it is. So you're like, what is this? Uh, some of them get Bradley at outline. Yeah. Are you, are you guys are on it. Cool. All right. Very good. Um, so what is, a, what is this uh, garrison or cohort or whatever? It means 6,000 troops. I mean, 600 troops. 6,000 is the legion, so it's a tenth of a legion. Isn't that interesting? So our scholar kind of debates, well, maybe they're just exaggerating because they're showing that Jesus is larger than life and he can take care of any problem. <laughs> or maybe he really did. Maybe he did have a, a Roman cohort, which is a tenth of a legion. Yeah, that's what it is. It's a cohort. If you look up, if you, and sure enough, if you look it up, um, that's, that's one of the, uh, one of the uh, definitions it's one of the, it's a it's a pretty old word in the English language, and uh, it came from Latin, and it means it means a tenth of a legion. It means six hundred men, basically what it means. So I found that really fascinating. So yeah, that's why we didn't just move forward with this narrative because there's so much interesting stuff going on. Yeah, uh, we'll we'll get through the video and then we'll do the questions. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, just, just hold on to it. Yeah, I, I want to answer any questions. We're going to have some good conversation with it. So, 
That's interesting. Yeah, 600 men. All right. So this larger-than-life scene was not a match for Jesus when he, when he spoke and they fell to the ground. And that's what I opened up with, and Mel, you brought that up with. I can't believe that they actually got themselves back up and said, we're searching for Jesus of Nazareth. I am he. Okay. All right, Jim, you, you go tie him up. <laughs> I mean... <laughs> Um, I'll, I'll hold my sword to him. <laughs> you actually, you actually went ahead and arrest him. So here it is in six. Now, when he said, "I am He," they drew back and fell to the ground. So that's I, I have to, I do I have to stop. This part of scripture I always found baffling and just fa uh, uh, fascinating, baffling and fascinating. And this Gospel of John ha does show that there is no big problem for Jesus to figure out. Amen? Here's one of his first big problems that he was presented with, and he figured it out. He was able to do something about it. In 2.9, when the master of the feast, feast had tasted the water that was made wine and did not know where it came from, but the servants who, who had drawn the water knew, because it was water, now it's wine, the master of the feast called the bridegroom. And then, of course, he says, that's great. If you go to 11, this is the beginning of the signs that Jesus did at Canaan of Galilee and manifested his glory and his disciples believed in his name. So first big problem that Jesus is presented with is they're running out of wine at a wedding feast. That's a pretty big problem. Yeah, that's not good. What did Jesus do? He fixed it. All right. Here's another, here's another big problem. You guys ready for another big problem that John shows us? Later on, he's going to face down 600 men, right? This is where we're at. But let's go to 6, 10, and, and uh, 12. 10 through 12. All right. Then Jesus said, make them sit down. Now there was much grass in that place, so they sat down in the number about 5,000. What's going on? You got 5,000 hungry people. That's a problem. <laughs> well, let's go on. Then Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks to his disciples and distributed them to the disciples, um, and, and to those who were sitting down, and likewise the fish as much as they wanted. So when they were filled, how many people were filled? 5,000, yeah. Plus women and children, yes, yes. He said to the disciples, gather up the fragments that remain so that nothing is lost. There was leftovers. I love it when I got leftovers. That's another meal. <laughs> I paid for one meal and got two out of it. Amen. Yeah, Jesus is more than enough. He is sufficient. Amen. So there was that. Also, John has, has a thing about showing us how he was extravagantly, extravagantly worshipped. Here we go. Let's go to 12. 3. John. Yeah, John 12, 3. Yep, we're still in John. We, we, the only, only time we had to go outside of this gospel was in Matthew to look at the cohort, garrison, however they like to translate that word. All right. Then Mary took a pound. How much? A pound. A very costly oil of spikenard anointed his feet and wiped his wiped his feet with her hair, and the house was filled with the fragrant oil. And then later on, Ju Judas goes, why this waste? So our scholar brings that out right here. How many men is he facing? A cohort, 600. All right. Has he dealt with some big problems? Yes. Has he been extravagantly worshipped? Yes. Mary took a whole pound of that. She probably just needed a dab, but she took a pound. Yeah. And just dumped it over him, basically. All right. That's the way to worship Jesus. Amen. And then he was taken care of when we, when, when we get to the next chapter in, in 1939 through 40. Here we go. This is what they did for his body. And Nicodemus, who was first came to Jesus by night, also came bringing a mixture of uh, myrrh and aloe about a hundred pounds. <laughs> Our scholar says that you can look at this, and they said it's over 75 pounds is how they translate this. Our, ours just says about a hundred pounds. 
Then they took the body of Jesus and bound it in strips of linen and, and spices as custom of the Jews is to bury. Um, I don't know how much it is, but according to a scholar, it was way more than enough. So people loved him so much when it came time for his burial, he had more than enough, way more than enough. Yeah. So this is how extravagantly he was taken care of, how extravagantly he worshipped, but how extravagantly he was able to answer problems. Amen. He made the best wine they ever had when he answered the, their problem, the very first problem. So here we go. Keep going. But also, he would give a great amount to his answer to any situation, right? We already saw this. Well, at the end of, the, at the end of it, his disciples decide, you know, we don't know what to do right now. Let's just go fishing. To me, that sounds like a plan. <laughs> Let's just go fishing. So they went fishing, and they were having another night where they caught nothing. So, and then Jesus shows up. Let's go to 21, 11 through 12. Simon Peter went up and dragged the net to the land full of large fish, 153. <laughs> they record it. And although there were so many, the net was not broke. And Jesus said, come and eat breakfast. I like Jesus. <laughs> hey, I'm your answer. You guys want some breakfast? <laughs> oh, you want some fish? Here, have 153. By the way, I got some breakfast made. You guys want to come eat this before you clean those? <laughs> yeah. 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 And then this is where Jesus says, you're not a fisherman anymore. He's going he's gonna to tell him some other things and really help Peter out. Yet none of the disciples dared ask him, who are you, knowing that this was the Lord? Well, of course. <laughs> Only Jesus answers that way, amen? He gives you more than enough. So our scholar brings that out. Another good note, don't you guys agree? That's another cool note. Jesus is extravagant in his answers and what he does. And then, you know, 600 men, I am he. Well, there you go. I'll take care of you <laughs> if you want to be taken care of. I'd be done. Anyways, Jesus alone has stood off a mixture of soldiers and troops uh, from the chief priests and Pharisees before. So check this out. Let's go to 732 and then look at verse 45 of that same chapter. The Pharisees uh, heard the crowd murmuring these things concerning him, and the Pharisees and the chief priests sent officers to take him. Well, what happened? Go to 45. Then the officers came to the chief priests and Pharisees who said to them, Why have you not brought him? And of course they go on in 46. The officer says, No one has ever spoken like this man. Yeah, I'd be done too. I would be done too. But unfortunately they weren't. And they are, and this is interesting. And you know, the other gospels, I believe, bring this out. And they actually say it in the synoptic gospels. Uh, they are an an unnatural group to work together to have a common enemy. All right. So I've always wondered, is, is this, um, you know, were these Roman soldiers that they, they gathered as well? Yeah, it was. I'll show you that here in a second. But right now it's an unnatural group of people working together. See, the, the, the priests were the Pharisees, were the Sadducees, and they didn't get along with the Pharisees. And, and uh, these groups, you know, really didn't uh, want to work together. But then this, the, the scripture actually goes on and says there was more groups that were religious groups that they continued to work with, which was unnatural. And then what did they do? They went and got the officers to do something about him. Who were the officers? <laughs> Romans. Yeah. Yeah, so it's yeah, it's just yeah, it's, it's an unnatural it's an unnatural group. So here we go. Let's go all the way back to 19. Here's the first two religious groups working together. 119 says, "Now this is the testimony of John when the Jews, remember that, sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, "Who are you?" So I believe those were the Sadducees. Keep going. Let's go to 24. Oh, where is 24? Yeah, now, now those who were sent were uh, from the Pharisees. So you see those two groups working together. Going on, go back to 7. Chapter 7 had a lot going on in it. 732. Here we go. 
the the Pharisees heard the crowd murmuring these things, yeah, and said and 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 concerning him and the and the Pharisees and the and the chief priests. There they are now together working, set officers to take him, which we already looked at. Of course, we already looked at forty five. That's when they get in trouble for not coming coming back empty handed, and they said no one spoke like him. Let's go to eleven forty seven. Then the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered a council and said, What shall we do for this man works many signs? There, there's them conspiring against him again. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's not, it's not, a, it's not a, a, common, uh, a natural group to do that. The Pharisees, as the enemies of Jesus, are not referred to anymore. Now, this is interesting. Another interesting note the scholar brought out. They're not referred to anymore, but this unnatural union takes place of the Jews. Now let me stop there because you know people might be catching this video and you might say something that, oh, that pastor is being anti Semitic. Know what the Bible says. Because I'm going to tell you what the Bible says. The Bible refers to the Jews being the enemy of Jesus and and also John the Baptist and the disciples. Now John the Baptist was a Jew, right? Jesus was a Jew. John, who's writing this, is a Jew. The whole point they're making when they're saying that the Jews are the enemy is that their own countrymen in the beginning of this gospel talks about that, that it was, it was G- Jesus came to his own and his own rejected him. That's in the first chapter. So the Bible is not anti-Semitic. Okay? Please. The gospel went to the Jews first and then the Gentiles. The Jews who rejected it, they lost. But some of the Jews believed. That's all through the New Testament, all right? So anyways, what our scholar brings out here, now that I got all that said, to help people, you know, that pastor's, a, he's talking hate speech. No, you don't. You need to figure out what a hole in the ground is and what your own backside is, anyways. Um, seriously, I, I mean, I, I watch the war of information and I'm just tired of it because you hear this stuff all the time. It's like, good grief. All right, so back to this. Our scholar brings this out because he's intelligent and no one needs to tell him about what the Bible's doing here. He says it's interesting. Now the enemies of Jesus is not just the Jews. It is an unnatural union of all sorts of people. Isn't that interesting? Now, let me just say something here. Is there a devil? Does he control the order of this world? Some people call it new. It's actually just the old world order. Yeah. Can you have um, uh, enemies that work, that work for the devil of every na- uh, nation and creed and, and group and gender and I'll say sexual orientation <laughs> right now? Yes. Yes, you can. It is the devil's kingdom building. And why is he building? Because the hour. The hour is coming. Yeah, we're about to talk about it. So the enemies of Jesus, let's look at more of them. Here they are. 19.6 says this, the next chapter over. Therefore, when the chief priests and officers saw them, they cried out, saying, Crucify him. Crucify him. Pilate said, uh, you, you, you take him and crucify him, for I find no fault. Look at that. They're working together to get that job done. Fifteenth of that chapter says, And they cried, Away with him. Away with him. Crucify him. Pilate said to them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priest a- answered and said, We have no king but Caesar. Do you guys realize how hypocritical that is, that they just, what they just said? Our, our God is, that'd be, that'd be like me saying, our God is the state. <laughs> our state is not the God. The state needs us. <laughs> the, state needs, the state needs the church to influence the state. That's the separation of church and state, not what other people think, by the way. Throw some more stuff in there for you. All right, let's look at 21. Therefore, the chief priest, uh, and then here it is, of the Jews, right, said to Pilate, do not write the king of the Jews, but he said, I, 
I am the king of the Jews. And then Pilate goes on, what I've written, I've written. Shut up. I'm done with you guys. But anyways, there you go. They're working with Rome. They are working with Rome, who they hate. Yep, yep. So here we go. Which could be seen as the ones who operate under the ruler of this world. What did Jesus say? He says, the ruler of this world is coming in 1430, and he has nothing in me. I'll give you the paraphrase before I give you the actual quote. I will no longer talk with you much. This is when they were starting to head out towards the, to the garden. For the ruler of this world is coming, and he has nothing in me. I got nothing for the devil either, amen? Now, at the end of this, it talks about the lanterns and the torches. Here's another interesting note the scholar brought out. This shows that, this shows that it is still the night that G Judas went out. It's still that night. I don't know if it's one in the, in the morning, but it's still that night. So here we go. Uh, 1330. This is Judas making his exit. Having received a piece of bread, he went out immediately, and it was night. Yeah. 1430 of, of uh, John. We're still in John. As Jesus ministered to his disciples all through 13 and 17, where was Judas? He went out that night. Is it still that night? Yes, it's still that night. This cohort was armed with weapons for the resistance. All right. Now, uh, Malice just, uh, Michaels leaves it at that, and I got to thinking about this, and I added this, but that is not what they got. Did they get resistance? No, Jesus spoke and they hit the ground. And then, and then, Jesus protected his disciples. Let's look at six and then eight and, and nine. Now, when he said to them, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. Yeah. And then let's go to eight. Jesus answered, I have told you that I am he. Therefore, if you seek me, let these go. And the saying might be fulfilled, which he spoken of those whom you've given me. I have lost none. They didn't get a resistance, did they? They felt the power of God, which baffles me that they actually put, picked themselves back up and arrested him. But... Um, they, uh, they didn't get a resistance, so their weapons were not needed. And then, you know, later on, Peter uses his weapon, and Jesus help, helps him understand that's not needed either, Peter. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, let, I'm on the video, so we'll, we'll do all questions afterwards. So here we go. All right. So there was a leader of this cohort. So this is what I was telling you guys earlier. Was, were these Romans? Yeah, they were Romans officers. Let's go to 12. Then the detachment of troops, there's that word again, cohort, and the captain of the officers and the Jews arrested Jesus and bound him. That were Ro Those were Roman. So it was Rome involved in this. All right. But Judas was the, was, the, was the guide of the detachment of troops, and his betrayal is seen in his role. And this is how the scholar ends this, this uh, uh, note. His role in the arrest is placed front and center. So that is what that is what Judas did. Was he guilty of something? Yes. He is placed front and center as being the one who betrayed him. Yeah. So here we go. Verse 4. Jesus therefore knowing that all things that would come from him went forth and said to them whom are you seeking? So this will be our last verse. Here we go. Jesus, therefore, knowing, that word knowing, it's a participle, and it's in the perfect tense. That's cool. So the perfect tense means that an event has taken place with continuous effects. So Jesus, having divine knowledge, knew exactly what to do. You're like, why are you bringing that out, John? Stay tuned. I'm going to show you some more cool things the scholar brought out. And then going on, all right, going on, uh, knowing that all things that would come upon him or was going to happen is how Mount uh, translates that participle. That is present, but now it's also, but now it's in the middle voice. So, yeah, the situation was doing this. Jesus knew what the situation was doing. <laughs> that's, the, that's the only way I can describe the, what the Greek grammar is doing there. All right. Going, going uh, further with the note, uh, with the, the, with, with the uh, verse, 
uh, would come upon him, went forth. All right, so we're back to the narrative. He stepped forward is how Mounts puts it, because now it's a verb and it's in the heiress, and also the active voice, so it's happening. But it's said in a generic way. And then he said, and every time he says something, it's always in the present tense, which is, a, which is the verb in present tense and active. So there you go. Now, he also asked after that, um, said to them, whom, the last part of that uh, question, are you seeking or you are looking for is how Mounts translates that. And again, he's now talking, it's present tense. Every time Jesus speaks, it's present tense in the Gospel of John. When the narrative is going forward, it's just in the aorist tense. So that's how, the, that's how that's working. All right. Jesus' supernatural knowledge is spoken again here. Again, is spoken of that he understood every step who was going to betray him, what was going to happen as it did. All right? And what was going to happen as it did. So he understood every step to do. He knew who was betraying him, and he knew what was going to happen next. Isn't that interesting? I'm just going to let you guys know, because the scholar is going to show you something too. You know that we can have supernatural knowledge, and we can know something ahead of time? Yeah. Yeah. I've had that happen once in the spirit, and I didn't know why the spirit was warning me, and then it happened, and I reacted wrong. I went, oh, God was trying to help me. <laughs> yeah, he was trying to help me, and I just blew that one. All right, so let's go to 664. But there, were some, there are some of you who do not believe, for Jesus knew. There it is. There's that supernatural knowledge, probably in the perfect tense. It's been a while since we've been in chapter 6. From the beginning... Who, who did not believe and who was going to betray him. He knew it. All right, let's go to 13, 1 and 3. This is where he finally gets alone with his disciples, and this is what John has to say about him. Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come. Are we in that hour? Yeah, we're, we're right as that hour is beginning. And, he's, and he stood uh, sh- should depart this world uh, to the Father... So, yeah, when Jesus knew that his hour had come, there's that supernatural knowledge, and then, of course, it goes on, that he should depart this world, uh, go back to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. He loved them to the end of the cross, right? He even protected them, which I already showed you, and next week we're going to be looking at that, how he protected them. Let's look at three. Jesus knowing, there it is again, supernatural knowledge, that the Father had given him all things into his hand, and that and that that he had come forth from God and was going to God. So Jesus had supernatural knowledge. He knew every step. He knew who was betraying him. He knew the next thing to do, and he did it. What did he do back in our verse? He stepped forward and said, whom are you seeking? And, of course, that kicks off the arrest after they have to hit the ground. Yeah. All right. Now check this out. 1613. Check this out. He said this to his disciples. Now, if Jesus says something to his disciples, that, can that apply to us too today? Oh, yeah. Here it is. However, when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. Yeah. Yeah. You want to have a test coming up? <laughs> I'd pray in the spirit. <laughs> That's what I would do. <laughs> yeah. And he would, and, and for he would not speak of his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak and tell you things to come. Did Jesus live that out purposely because he was led by the Father? Yes, he did. Amen. All right. Which shows that he was completely in control. Now, this is where a lot of ministers will stop and make this big point about how the cross seemed like the biggest chaotic thing uh, of failure. But guess what? God was in control. Yeah. Because think about it. Put yourself in the disciples. They watched their Lord and their master, who they just realized just came from God, get crucified. They had no idea in that dark hour what was going on, even though Jesus, I like the Holy Spirit. He's trying to clue me in on some things too. Even though Jesus clued them in on something bad's about to happen, but don't worry, it's all in God's plan. So, is the devil and his hour in control? No. He just had an hour. 
God has eternity. Amen. Amen. All right. So it shows that he was completely in control and was not taken by surprise. Yeah. So Mount's bring, or Michael, sorry, our, our Bible scholar brings out some good stuff here. Jesus, with this knowledge, now steps forth and, as, 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 as in and out of the garden. Okay. I think I just went as out. Let's cross out that in. That didn't need to be there. Out of the garden that they just entered and asked the question, whom are you seeking to the detachment of troops? Okay, why is that a big deal? Because back in, um, back at the beginning of this, where did they go? Let's go back to one. When Jesus spoke these words, he went out with his disciples to the book, book Kidron, where there was a garden which he and his disciples entered. I meant verse 1, not verse 3. Yeah. So, so he comes out of the garden he just stepped in. Now, do you guys remember our study last week? Who's the door? Yeah. Do you see Jesus protecting his disciples? You definitely do. Especially with, with his, uh, his, his discourse that he has with the, with the cohort, with the 600 men with Judas, the conversation he has with them, you see Jesus protecting his own. Isn't that awesome? That'll help me sleep tonight. <laughs> yeah, pretty cool. All right. So this question takes us back to the first that, what, that was ever asked him. What was the very first question ever asked Jesus? Or Jesus ever asked? Jesus asked. He goes, what are you seeking? Let's go to 138. Then Jesus turned and seeing them uh, following, said to them, what do you seek? And they said to him, Rabbi, which is to say, translated teacher, where are you staying? And then, of course, he says, come and see, and they became his disciples, which was good because he was gathering his disciples, but there were others who came for a questionable motives throughout this gospel. All right? So some people came to see him that were questionable. I'll show you that. 6, 24, and 26. This is after he fed the 5,000. 5, yeah, the 5,000. When the people saw that Jesus was not there and his disciples, they got into the boats and came to Capernaum seeking him. Now Jesus finally talks to them in 26. Jesus answered and said to them, Most assuredly I say to you, you seek me not because you saw the signs, not because you saw the sign, but because you ate the loaves and were filled. You see that Jesus knew that some people were coming to him for a questionable motive. The only reason you should ever get to, to, to seek God is because of salvation. Seriously. Seriously. And even hostile motives. So here we go. Are we in that hour? We are in that hour. Let's, let's go through this marathon of verses. Here we go. Let's start at 518. This is where they really got hacked off with him. They really got ticked off. Here we go. In 518, therefore the Jews, those are the enemies, the, his own countrymen, right, sought all the more to kill him because he not only broke the Sabbath, but also said that God was his father, making himself equal with God. Wow, that really got him. Let's go to 7-1. A lot, lot goes on in chapter 7. 7-1, after these things Jesus walked in Galilee, for he did not want... He did not walk in Judea because the Jews sought to kill him. Yeah, they were being hostile. Let's go to verse 11. When the Jews sought, sought him at the feast and said, where is he? So they're looking for him. Yep, 19 and 20 of this chapter says, Did not Moses give you the law, yet, yet, yet none of you keep the law? Why do you seek to kill me? That's Jesus talking. They answered, the people answered and said, You have a demon who's seeking to kill you. Uh, Jesus is not dumb. All right, verse 25, some of them uh, from Jerusalem said, is this not whom they are seeking to kill? Yeah, the crowd knew what was going on. Verse 30, therefore they sought to take him, but no one laid a hand on him because his hour, what hour are we in? That hour, yeah, had not yet come. Verses 34 to 35, which we've seen some of these already. Oh yeah, I, I love this. This is Jesus talking. You will seek me and not find me, and where I am, where I am, you cannot come. Then the Jews <laughs> said amongst themselves, "Where does he intend to go? Shall we, where we, that we can't find him? Does he intend to go to the dispersion among the Greeks? No, Paul will do that later. 
<laughs> and teach the Greeks? Yeah. No, that happened later. Actually, it happened in John. The, the Greeks did come to see him in ch chapter 12, yeah. And then the New Testament unfolds, right? The book of Acts starts, amen? But no, that's not where he's going. Uh, you're going to where God is not, and he's going back to his father. That's what he was saying to him. All right, and then 8 is where they really try to kill him, but let's look at 8, 21, 37, and 40. Here we go, 8, 21. It says... That Jesus said to them again, I am going away and you will seek me. And you and this is where he really tells them, you're not going to end up where I'm at. And will die in your sins. Where I go, you cannot come. That's what he says to his enemies. In 37, he goes, I know that you're Abraham's descendants, but you seek to kill me because my word has no place in you. He goes on to tell them, neither does Abraham's words, neither does the word of God. You think you're in the word of God, but you're not. And if you were, you would recognize me. Verse 40, but now you seek to kill me, a man who has told you the truth, which I heard from God. And here it is. You're not Abraham. Abraham did not do this. That's where he corrects them. You say you're a descendant of Abraham, but your, your actions are not showing that. Let's go to 1039. Therefore they sought again to seize him, but he escaped out of their hands. Why? Because it was not his hour. 11.8 says, The disciples said to him, Rabbi, lately the Jews sought to stone you, and you are you going there again? Yeah, he has to raise Lazarus. Lazarus needs to be raised. And then we get to the end of that chapter, in 56 of 11. They sought Jesus and spoke amongst themselves as they stood in the temple. What do you think? That he will not come to the feast? Yeah, he'll show up to the feast, but later. Yeah, he did that. He pulled that off again. Yep. And then, of course, he gets in there, and that's where uh, um, he starts to uh, talk about Lazarus because he knows Lazarus has passed away. All right. So, did they come at him with hostile, being hostile? Yes, they did. What they wanted, what what they wanted to do here is to arrest him and kill him, which is now the time for that hour. All right. So we did look at some of these scriptures, but this is where the, the Bible really clues in that they're going to arrest him and they're going to kill him. So let's go back to 730. And it says, Therefore they sought to take him, but no one laid a hand on him because his hour had not yet come. 32 and 30, through 36 says this, the, the Pharisees heard the crowd murmuring these things concerning him, the Pharisees and the chief priests and the officers sent officers to take him. Jesus said to them, I shall be with you a little while longer, and then I go to, to him who sent me. You will seek me and not find me, and where I am going you cannot come. Then the Jews said amongst themselves, where does he intend to go? Shall we, uh, where we will not find him? Does he intend to go to the dispersion among the Greeks to teach the Greeks? No, that's what Paul will do later. What, what is this thing he says, you will seek me and not find me, and where I'm going, you cannot come. It's not his hour. Of course, we saw this with the officers in 45 through 46. We'll look at it again. Then the officers came to the chief priests and Pharisees and said to them, Why have you not brought him? The officers answered, No man spoke like this man. Why? It's not his hour at that time. It is now where we're at in the book of John. 8.20 says, And these words Jesus spoke in the treasury as he taught in the temple, and no one laid a hand on him, for his hour had not yet come. Verse 59 of this chapter says, Then they took up stones to throw at him, but Jesus hid himself and went out from the temple, going through the midst of them, and so passed by, because it was not the hour at that time. At the end of 11, 47 through 50 verses, in chapter 11, says this, which wasn't his time yet. <laughs> Here it is. Then the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered a council and said, What shall we do for this man works signs? If we let him alone like this, everyone will believe him. Well, you should just leave him alone. Believe him yourself. And the Romans, look at that, will come and take away our place and nation. So what did they decide to do? Work with the Romans to arrest him. That's where we're at. And, and then one of them, Caiaphas, being the high priest that year, said to them, You know nothing at all, 
nor do you consider that this is expedient for us, that this man should die for the people and not for the whole nation, that, that the whole nation should not perish. He did not say this on his own authority, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the nation. So that was his plan. That was the prophecy, but he didn't realize that was the actual plan of God and a prophecy being fulfilled from the Old Testament that the perfect Lamb of God was going to come someday. All right, here we go. Then on from that day, they, they plotted, there it is, they plotted to put him to death. How did they finally get that done? They had to get a hold of the Romans. Therefore, Jesus could no longer walk openly among the Jews, but went from, from there into the country near, uh, near the wilderness to the city called Ephraim, and there he remained with his disciples. Why did he do that? Because it was not his hour. Now, let's look at Luke twenty-two, fifty-three, 53, and guess what Luke's going to say? He's going to confirm what everything we just looked at. In Luke 22, 52 through 53, it says, Then Jesus said to the chief priests and captains in the temple and the elders who had come to him, Have you come out as against a robber with swords and clubs? That was our last verse. That was verse 3, wasn't it? They were armed. When I was with you daily in the temple, you, tried, you did not seize me, but this is your hour and the power of darkness. So here we are. Happy pre-Passion Week. We're going to be studying this all through Passion Week and beyond. <laughs> so, yes. It is now Jesus' hour. Jesus had supernatural knowledge of what was going to go on. God was in complete control. Jesus stood in front of those people and he was protecting his disciples because he is the door. He is the great shepherd. And then what is he going to do? He did what they said in chapter 10. He's going to lay his life down. They did not need their weapons. They didn't need it. Jesus protected his, his sheep. His sheep go running. They take him down. Had no idea. They're fulfilling prophecy so you and I could be saved. Amen? Amen. Happy pre-Passion Week. We'll leave you guys with that.